So today I'm speaking about imported vivax malaria in the UK and the reason I've been asked to do this is, as Phil's mentioned, Chris and I have recently been doing a look back at the last 27 years worth of imported vivax in the UK, looking particularly at the epidemiology, risk factors and trends for the disease in this country and I want to share some of that with you today because I think it's relevant to all of us as ID physicians. So Vivax malaria doesn't get quite as much press, I think, as falciparum malaria, particularly when you're looking at imported malaria. And falciparum malaria obviously makes up the higher proportion of cases that we see in the UK and obviously has the ability to cause severe malaria and deaths. But I want to make the point, first of all, that Vivax isn't a small print subject. It's actually the most widely distributed of the common causes of malaria um, worldwide, and you find it in... Latin America, Africa, and importantly, large, large areas of South and Southeast Asia. And up to about 2.5 billion people are at risk worldwide, and there's up to 300 million cases each year, it's estimated. And it's actually the commonest form of malaria outside of Africa. And so if you're seeing people who are planning to travel or who are on well and have recently returned from traveling in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, they're all potentially at risk of having acquired Vivax or getting Vivax while they travel, and therefore it's something we all need to have an awareness of. The other thing that makes um, Vivax a bit different, and particularly to falciparum, is its ability to form hypnozoites in the liver. And I'm not going to go into the details here because hopefully most of you know about this already, but essentially this is a <coughs> dormant form of the parasite that sits in the liver and then one day can reactivate, causing parasitemia and something called relapse with um, associated clinical symptoms, so clinical malaria. So moving on to imported Vivax malaria in the UK. As most of you know, malaria is a notifiable disease, and so whenever you have a case, you have to notify it. And the UK Public Health England Malaria Reference Laboratory they maintain the National Surveillance Database for malaria cases. And they get notifications from public health authorities, from uh, clinicians and from laboratories. And it's been going since uh, 1987. And for inclusion on the database, you need to have a confirmed case of malaria. So through PCR, through slides and also, sorry, through blood films and also through histology. And when we did our work, we looked at 1987 to 2013, and by then, just over 50,000 cases of malaria had been collected onto this database. So it's a really excellent resource. It's a passive case detection system, so you're relying on people to notify. So obviously not all cases are going to get captured by the system. And the capture rate for this particular MRL system is estimated to be about 56% which might not sound very high, but actually by international standards is thought to be very, very good. There's always going to be a bit of a reporting bias and some places might report more cases than others. And so, for example, with falciparum cases and cases from London, capture rates are thought to be a bit higher. So this is where we got our data from. So over the last 27 years, Vimex malaria has accounted for just over a quarter of the UK's malaria cases. So we had just over 12,000, nearly 13,000 cases. And the people who are most likely to get Vimex malaria are sort of youngish adult men, most of whom haven't used any form of chemoprophylaxis. And probably of that 23%, I suspect many of them didn't use their chemoprophylaxis properly. And the vast majority are born abroad, and particularly in the UK, people born in India and Pakistan were the two main countries. And over 80% of the UK's uh, Vivax cases are imported from South Asia, and actually 78% come from just <coughs> India and Pakistan alone. About 50% of our cases come from India. And this is very different to non-Vivax malaria. The vast majority of these are going to be falciparum cases, where almost all of your cases are coming from West, Central, East and Southern Africa. Whereas Vivax malaria in the UK is really a disease of South Asia. Vivax malaria is similar to falciparum in that the group who are most at risk of acquiring it and bringing it back to the UK and the VFR group, so people who usually have heritage from a malarial endemic country, who go back to their home country to visit friends or relatives, and then they acquire their malaria there and bring it back. 
and um, Vivax and non-Vivax malaria are very similar here, and that this is the main at-risk group, <coughs> whereas tourists are um, obviously far less likely to acquire it. And there's lots of potential reasons for this. Um, I'll mention some of them briefly. So people who go back to visit friends and families probably tend to spend a bit longer in a malarial setting when they're there, so the time that they're at risk is longer. They're probably more likely to go to slightly less urbanised settings where they might be at slightly higher risk of getting bitten. And also we know from studies that they're less likely to seek pre-travel advice and they're less likely to take chemoprophylaxis. So there's sort of methods of preventing malaria probably less common than those who are travelling as tourists. So in summary, your group of people you're looking at who are likely to be bringing Vivax to the UK and presenting with Vivax malaria are going to be young adult men who've been born in India or Pakistan, who travel to India or Pakistan to visit friends or relatives and then come back. So I've shown that Vivax malaria and non-Vivax, and particularly falciparum malaria, have quite different um, at-risk groups um, by the sort of ethnic groups that they affect. And if you look at how the UK migrant populations are spread geographically throughout the UK, they're quite different. So the central and West African communities mainly get large communities centred in and around London and the South East. And so these are the people who can be at risk of bringing back falciparum. Whereas the South Asian communities, you get large centres in London, but also in the Midlands and the North West and in Yorkshire. So it's perhaps not entirely surprising, therefore, that your falciparum malarias and your vivax malarias are going to be quite differently um, spread geographically. So falciparum malaria is almost entirely concentrated in London and the southeast. So about 75% 75 of cases are in London and the southeast, with a few um, areas centred around the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine in Manchester. But it's really a disease of London and the southeast. And I expect some of these other cases are probably more likely the tourist ones. But for Vivax, the distribution is quite different. So you do have centres in London, but you have equal numbers seen in the northwest, and also Yorkshire is a big centre for Vivax, and also the Midlands. And what this means is if you're, seeing, if you're seeing a patient in London who you think has got malaria, they're almost certainly going to have falciparum malaria. But if you're seeing a patient in the northwest or in Yorkshire and Humber, it's actually more likely that they're going to have Vivax malaria rather than falciparum malaria. So it's really important if you're working not only in London, where we usually think of malaria as being problem, problematic, it's really important if you're working in Yorkshire, the northwest and the Midlands, that you have a working idea of Vivax malaria, you know how to counsel people <coughs> about the risks and also how to recognise it and treat it. And looking back over the last 27 years, the numbers of Vivax cases being imported to the UK have dropped really very significantly. And this is despite the number of travellers travelling to India and Pakistan, where most of our cases come from, increasing very rapidly, including this sort of risky VFR group of travellers. And what this means is that over time, your risk of acquiring Vivax malaria, should you take a trip to India or Pakistan, has reduced really very dramatically, particularly over the 1990s. And so now the risk is significantly lower than it was 20 years ago. And because of this uh, reduction in risk, this has been reflected in the UK's guidelines on um, advising travellers on malaria prevention and chemoprophylaxis. So in India, where previously historically larger areas were, um, it was advised that you take prophylaxis, it's now just Arissa and Assam, a couple of other small regions where chemoprophylaxis is recommended. And I think this is reasonable from the data that I've shown you because the risk of IVAX is clearly much smaller now than it was previously. And when you're thinking about advising chemoprophylaxis, you're always trying to balance the benefits and the risks. And there are small but um, significant risks attached to chemoprophylaxis. So I think it's reasonable to limit it. Vivax malaria has typically, has sort of traditionally been described as one of the benign malarias. So falciparum is the one that causes severe disease and deaths traditionally, and Vivax along with Ovali and malaria, I thought, to not cause severe disease. We couldn't capture 
severe disease from the database because we didn't have that information recorded, but we could look at deaths. And we found that if you got Vivax and you were aged less than 50, you didn't die from Vivax. But if you were aged 70 or older, there was a significant mortality associated with it. And these were people where it was recorded that they had died from Vivax rather than another cause. And so just as a comparison, the mortality overall for cephalstiprin in this country is 0.74%. So actually Vivax, if you're elderly, isn't the benign disease that it's previously been described as. And I think when you're advising people on chemoprophylaxis, it's important to bear this in mind, not only their risk of actually acquiring Vivax while they're there, but for them individually, what would getting Vivax mean? And if you have an elderly traveller, I think you need to think more carefully about the advice that you're giving on chemoprophylaxis. So I mentioned earlier that falciparum malaria creates these hypnozoic forms in the liver, which can lie dormant there for periods of time before relapsing to cause parasitemia and clinical symptoms. And we looked at the latency between someone arriving back in the UK after which she couldn't become infected again with Fivax and developing symptoms and found that on average there was a 68-day delay before people became symptomatic, but with an intercourse hour range of 9 to 212 days. So I think this highlights the importance of taking really full travel history, not just asking about travel a month or two ago, but asking travel you know, way back to the year or two previously, and in fact, any travel. And it means that Vivax can be quite difficult to um, diagnose, potentially, because you need that travel history in order to think of it. And travel may have taken place so long ago that it's either forgotten or overlooked by the patient. So you need to ask. And also, if you're counselling people on travel um, before they go, you need to make sure that they're aware that if they get a fever, even many months down the line, or even a year or two down the line, to mention that travel and ask about Vivax when they see a doctor. So the next thing we did was we looked at how Vivax cases are distributed over the course of the year. So this is the number of Vivax cases um, which have been diagnosed each month. So in other words, the number of Vivax cases that are becoming symptomatic and presenting and getting diagnosed each month. And you can see the vast majority are getting diagnosed in the summer months. Actually, 74% of cases get diagnosed in the period April to September, and just 26% of cases from October through to March. And this peak in cases doesn't really mirror the peak in traveller numbers that we see between the UK and India and Pakistan. Now, if you were to look at this data sort of on its own, this raw data, you might come to the conclusion that it's only really travellers who are travelling in the summer who are getting Vivax malaria, and that people who travel in the wintertime are at little or no risk. But this data is quite misleading because you need to remember that these, these cases are clinical presentations. So what we can see here is people becoming symptomatic in the summer. It doesn't tell us anything about when they're actually acquiring the infection because we know there's this long latency. <coughs> so we looked at that for India and Pakistan because that's where most of our cases came from. And actually, people are at risk of acquiring Vivax all year round, so not just in that summer peak. You're at slightly high risk if you travel during the rainy season of July to September, which would make sense because there's more stagnant water around, more mosquitoes biting, um, but there's transmission all year round. So if you looked at that previous graph and said, right, let's just target travellers during the summer period for our prevention messages, for our chemoprophylaxis, or if you're a public health doctor in India or Pakistan and you said, let's just target that summer period because that seems to be where all the Vivax cases are occurring, you'd actually be missing the rest of the year where there is some background transmission. So we see this large peak in summer clinical cases. And so we wondered why are we seeing this um, <coughs> predominance of summer cases. So the next thing we looked at is latency. And latency, I think, is one of the most interesting things about Vivax. And there have been suggestions from other papers that latency might be influenced by external factors, including environmental, seasonal, geographical factors. And it's quite difficult to study latency in an endemic setting because you're always going to have background new infections appearing and trying to tease apart what new infection, which ones are new infections and which ones are relapses is impossible because they're clinically identical. But if you're in a non-endemic setting like the UK, 
you have a very nice opportunity to do this because clearly once someone arrives back in the UK, they can't acquire a new case of Vibax. So all cases that you're going to see are going to be predominantly relapses. So we looked at latency by the month that people arrived back in the UK, and we found that there was a marked seasonal variation in latency. So to remind you, this is the time for, between someone arriving in the UK and becoming symptomatic. So if you arrived in the UK in the winter months, you waited on average 120 days before becoming symptomatic. As we arrived in the summer months, it was just 41 days. And actually, if we look at the extremes in July, it's less than a month, whereas in November, looking at sort of over four months. And so what this means is really regardless of what time of year you travel and regardless of what time of year you acquire your Vibax, because of where relapse tending to occur in the summer and becoming parasitemic in the summer, you're going to generally present in the summer and get diagnosed with Vivax in the summer. And that, I think, explains um, a great deal of that large peak in summer cases that I showed you earlier. And most of our cases come from India and Pakistan. <coughs> and that summer period is where the monsoons come in India and Pakistan. And it makes evolutionary sense, I think, that a parasite would become adapted so that it tends to relapse and become parasitemic during the monsoons when we know there's higher levels of mosquitoes, higher people getting bitten, and therefore your likelihood as a parasite of being transmitted is going to be a lot higher. It has been suggested that perhaps it's not an adaptation to the modern scenes, but maybe there's something locally happening which is affecting the parasite. So is the parasite relapsing because of the warmer summer weather in Britain over the summer? If this was a case, then you might expect, therefore, that all cases of Vivax malaria, um, regardless of where they come from in the world, should have this tendency to relapse, therefore, in the summer because they're all experiencing this warmer British summer weather. And so we looked at that, and so we separated out our Indian cases, Pakistan cases, and then the rest of the world. And we found that the seasonal latency was still present for the Indian and Pakistani cases, and in fact, a stronger or a, um, even wider difference between winter and summer cases. But for the rest of the world cases, there was no significant difference between summer and winter. Now, clearly, in this rest of the world group, which is a very heterogeneous group, you're going to have countries which have their own monsoon seasons. And it would be very interesting to look at them individually to see how their latency, period, how their latency periods change over time according to the time of their own monsoons. But unfortunately, just in terms of the demographics of our Vivax cases here, we just don't have enough numbers to be able to look at that in great detail and to do any reliable seasonal analysis. So that brings me to the end of a very whistle-stop tour through Vivax malaria in the UK. I think the things I wanted you to take home from the talk were it's mainly a disease of VFRs, and most of our cases come from India and Pakistan, and the geographical distribution in the UK reflects that. The risk-benefit of chemoprophylaxis is changing as the risks of requiring Vivax when you travel are reducing, but it isn't a benign disease, particularly in the elderly, <coughs> and you need to be aware of that. And your risk of acquiring Vivax in India or Pakistan is year-round, but because of the seasonal latency, cases tend to present in the summer months, regardless of time of year travels. And that is everything. Oh.